Hi, I'm Dr. Andy Martin. I'm with the Marcus Heart Valve Center here at Piedmont Atlanta, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Morris Brown. Morris is the chief of cardiovascular surgery here, and Morris, you're going to educate all of us about a very complex procedure. Morris is an expert in uh, thoracic aortic disease besides other things in cardiac surgery. So Morris, take us through what you've entitled a hybrid aortic repair. Okay, um, today we're going to talk a little bit about hybrid aortic repair and that's where you use two different technologies, open surgical repair and uh, endovascular techniques with uh, commercially available stent grafts. Um, and sometimes because of the com complexity of aortic disease, you're required to use both technologies and I've got a case that sort of... Okay, well, let's, let's, go, let's go into that. So <clears throat> this, is, this is a young gentleman, he was uh, 37 years old, he had presented uh, to the ER with a type A dissection. Uh, back in January of 2012. He didn't have any family history of Marfan's or any connective tissue disease. He was uh, very hypertensive. Um, he presented with moderate aortic insufficiency. His arch was dissected. His head vessels were dissected, but he was neurologically intact. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, obviously he went emergently to the operating room. Here's a picture of what his CT scan looked like. And you can see that his uh, arch is uh, dissected. Certainly involved. And then these are the head vessels. This is the anominate um, and his left carotid and left subclavian. All of them uh, contain dissections as well. So this complicates his surgical procedure initially when we took him to the OR. So uh, there's a decision to be made as to what the repair should be sure. when we first took him. Sure. So um, the simplest thing to do is uh, replace the ascending aorta using circulatory rest, um, repair the uh, true lumen to the false lumen with a neo of with a piece of felt, and some uh, tissue glue. Okay. Um, or you could do a full arch replacement, which is technically more difficult, takes longer, and has a higher risk. Um, or you could do a hybrid procedure at that time, with the, uh, which is called a frozen elephant trunk. And we'll talk a little bit more about elephant trunks in a minute, okay. so I don't want to dwell on that right now. Um, the aortic insufficiency, you can either replace the root or just resuspend the valve and repair the function of the valve. Um, we chose to repair the function of the valve because his root was not overly dilated and the, the root itself was not dissected. And, so. and Morris, most of these occur in the middle of the night, as, as you said this, this guy did. So, so you've got, you want to do a primary repair that you can do safely in that time, not a long, complicated thing. Correct. Is that right? Correct. That the focus at this point would be to, to save his life and get him through the initial operative procedure. Okay. okay. So, so that's what we did. Um, but then we had a problem that his arch continued to grow. Um, at six months, it was 4.3 centimeters. Uh, at a year, it was up to 5.2. And then up at a, a year and a half, six months later, because we had shortened the interval of how, how long we were looking at this, because we were concerned about the growth rate, it was up to six centimeters and really needed some additional. Your attention. primary repair was fine, but now he's got this. The primary uh, repair arch was fine. Problem. Um, but as you can see, th this is the graph that we had put in, and it had become foreshortened as the arch continued to grow. Interesting, interesting, okay. So the, we'll talk a little bit about zones. We, um, part of this is trying to stent graft all the way across the arch, and if you stent graft all the way across the arch, you're going to land in zone zero. And that really has been a, an area where you wouldn't land a stent graft because you have to provide blood flow to the head vessels some additional way. Most stent grafts are landed in either zone three or zone two, um, generally not in zone one because of uh, there's not enough space between the anominate and the left carotid uh, to provide a seal. Um, but we have started doing some in zone zero, but there's different ways that you uh, have to provide blood flow to the head. Okay. Um, so you can either do this completely open um, as an arch repair, and this is uh, where you, you do the descending part with a stent graft, and then you do the arch and the ascending with a standard open surgical technique. But the hybrid, which is what I wanted to talk to you about today, is where you debranch the head vessels using a graft that you put either on the native aorta, which is a type 1, right. um, or on a graft that you put on the ascending aorta, which is a type 2. Um, type 3 is a little more complicated. It's an open, uh, complete arch repair with uh, grafts to each of the head vessels done open uh, during circulatory rest with, at the operative procedure. And then completion of this, uh, you leave a portion of graft hanging down into the descending aorta. This is for more extensive disease that continues further Correct. down in the descending aorta. And so then you complete that with a stent graft. Um, and this, this part that hangs down in here is called an elephant trunk. Um, and uh, this is a picture that illustrates good, that. Good. Um, 
So this, this is a standard stent graft um, that you actually invert on itself and then sew it to the distal uh, thoracic aorta and then pull this part back out and sew it to the head vessels. And you can either do it like this individually or you can do it as a small pedicled island. Um, either is acceptable and then sew this to the uh, ascending aorta. Um, usually above the graft or if you've replaced the root then to, to your root replacement. Okay. okay. But this part hanging down in, the, in this aorta that's big is called the elephant trunk. Correct. And then you can access that through the leg, um, put a wire up through it. We usually leave some radiopaque markers on the ends of it right. so that we can see that uh, with fluoroscopy. Uh, wire that and then land a stent graft in that to complete the seal all the way down past the aneurysmal area. Okay. Okay. And that, and that generally works pretty well. So let's talk about a few of the technical problems that you might have while you're trying to do some of these complex arch uh, hybrid replacements. Just, just a few technical problems. <laughs> just a few. Um, one is that it's difficult uh, to f figure out that the back of the graft is going to land at the same place as the front of the graft, and that's called parallax error. And so you may land the back of the graft, because when the graft's all folded up, you don't know what's the front and what's the back. Okay. So you position it so that uh, one part of it is immediately adjacent to this graft that comes off of the ascending aorta, uh, but it may be the back of it like is shown in this drawing here. That puts the front of it way back here, and then that leaves very little area for this to seal, and you may end up with a leak in that area, and I think we'll, we'll see an example of okay. that. Okay. Um, this just goes through the technical parts of a type 1. Um, you don't need cardiopulmonary bypass for it. Um, you place a partial clamp on the ascending aorta, uh, put a multi-branched graft onto it, and this has got three branches for the innominate, left carotid, and left subclavian. But then there's this additional branch here that can be used, and in this case, is, there's no cardiopulmonary bypass involved, but you can use that to deploy your stent graft. So this is what it would look like, what these would look like. And then, so this, this is one in, in real life, this is uh, the side branch that I was talking about that you would deploy the stent graft through and then a slightly bigger graft for the innominate, one for the left carotid and, and a longer one for the left subclavian. And then this is what it looks like sewn onto the aorta and, and the, this is a still picture but the heart is beating during this and you don't require cardiopulmonary bypass. So he, those are all the options you have for this guy. Those okay, are all so, the options that we have. So this is what, what you're faced with. So here's what we were faced with. This, his aorta had continued to grow, and the problem was is not only was his arch big, but all his, his innominate artery was big, his carotid was okay after the first couple of centimeters, but the subclavian was uh, very aneurysmal all the way out until its uh, mid-portion. And so all that really needed to come out, or th this was going to be at risk for rupture, um, at a later date, and he's only 37 years old. And so, you know, generally you tend to try to do younger patients with a completely open procedure, but there was no open option for him. Correct. And so we really had to have the uh, hybrid approach okay. in order to, okay. to handle his okay. problem. I see. So what procedure should we do? I mean, he, he by definition, is going to be a type 2 uh, repair because he's already got an ascending graft. Um, we, you know, a standard elephant trunk wouldn't address the aneurysmal carotid and innominate like we just talked about. Um, so really the hybrid arch option was really the only option. So here we go, uh, we've uh, opened him up, uh, did not put him on cardiopulmonary bypass, put a side biting clamp on the uh, graft of the ascending aorta and put a branched graft and sewed it uh, to all the vessels. So it's, it's open to the innominate, um, which supplies the right subclavian and the right carotid. Um, it's open uh, to the left carotid and the left subclavian uh, as well. Uh, once we did that, it was time to land the stent graft. And you can see here, we've put these radiopaque markers here, these uh, small stainless steel sure, rings, sure. so that we know where to land the stent graft. And this one is immediately adjacent to the graft that is, um, that's there. Yeah, I can see, I see. And uh, then two centimeters downstream, which is the, the length that you need for adequate seal. You want to cover that. You want right? to cover that. Okay. That's where the seal occurs. And then you exclude all of this big false aneurysm that you have and false lumen of, of the uh, dissection so that the flow isn't, doesn't go into that anymore and that doesn't continue to grow. Okay. So that's, okay. that's the plan. Okay. So we would started accessing this from the arm, uh, from that side branch. And every time we would put the wire down, it would go into the false lumen. It, you know, looking at it uh, by fluoroscopy, you can't tell, but you can place intravascular ultrasound on it, and you can easily tell whether you're in the true lumen or the false okay. lumen. You really okay. want to be in the true lumen where the blood should be um, so that everything that's downstream from you is, is well perfused. 
So every time we put it in, it went into the false lumen. So what we did was we accessed it through the leg and actually put a snare up, um, made sure that the one from the leg was in the true lumen, and then grabbed the wire up in the arch and pulled it into the correct position so that when we deployed the stent graft, we knew it would be deployed okay. Okay. In, the, in the correct lumen. So here's what happened once we deployed the stent graft. And <laughs> the story doesn't end yet. The story is not <laughs> over not yet. yet. So the... Let me That's okay. I've got opacify this a little bit. That's so, fine. so here's the angiogram. Um, there's the O-ring, and you can see that our stent right. graft, instead of landing at this first O-ring where we wanted it to land, has landed at the second O-ring. And the problem that that causes is not an adequate seal zone, so the false lumen is still being perfused, and all of this gets opacified. Got so it. we have a, a, a type one endoleak. So the idea was that this was an, uh, an article that was written about uh, reinforcing the landing zone with some graft material on the outside to constrain the aorta and provide a longer length of uh, landing zone. So that was uh, what we had attempted to do. We uh, freed the aorta up. Um, he had had the prior dissection surgery um, several years prior and it was all very stuck and so in, in manipulating this to get that graft material around the aorta, I was successful at constraining the aorta but then we got a, an angiogram after that, and here's, here's what we got, that the stent graft had now sprung back into the false lumen and had, you know, it was no longer constrained in the true lumen as it was here, and so we just had a wide open end of leak. So at this point, there really is no other option other than to convert to an open surgical procedure, but we had been at this several hours already. He had a, an ongoing coagulopathy, and I didn't feel like it was safe to proceed at that time. Um, so we actually packed his chest open um, and brought him back a, a few days later. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was what, you know, what could we have done to try to get that endograft to make that turn. To, to, to put it back in its proper to, position to, at that yeah, point. Exactly, okay. to, to make that turn from the arch into the ascending aorta so that it would provide that seal. And one of the things that we've learned from doing transcatheter valves is that the, the safari wire that sits in the ventricle, it's a nice stiff wire that you can deploy a stent graft over, um, but it safely sits with a coil in the ventricle and then you can direct your stent graft toward the ventricle. Um, this is the surrogate of what's called body floss in the stent graft world where you uh, put a, a wire into the leg and uh, bring it out through the arm and actually put tension on both ends and then things that are very tortuous and you otherwise couldn't land a stent graft in, then you could Let's successfully straighten, straighten land a stent graft in there. And you also have percutaneous, you could, as, in you essence, could, do like you all do with TAB or transapical You do just like with transapical <clears throat> and access this. Um, at percutaneously and put a wire in and actually put tension on that wire out the bottom. So these of the are things you could have done look you know looking, looking back or right. thinking back. Now that back. our experience is better with um, ventricular wire management right. with right. TAVR. Okay. Um, so so here here's what what happened. We uh, brought him back to the operating room uh, after correcting his coagulopathy went back on bypass, I had saved this uh, side arm that we deployed the stent graft through and actually used that for cardiopulmonary bypass inflow cool. um, on the arterial side. Uh, then when I opened the aorta in order to repair this area that had sprung back, uh, that required circulatory arrest, I was able to put a clamp across the bottom of this and use this side arm to perfuse the head yes. vessels in the brain. Um, so he still had lower body circulatory rest, but the upper body was perfused the cool. entire time. Cool. Um, so the upper body was, was without blood only for six minutes, which is clearly acceptable. And we had anti-grade cerebral perfusion, which for 54 minutes um, that it took to open this up. I had to trim one, one layer of rings off of the stent graft and then sewed a little piece of uh, Dacron hemashield graft um, to the stent graft distally and then to his uh, repair graft that he already had placed prior at his aortic dissection. And so what that did was that directed all of the flow into the uh, true lumen uh, so that the false lumen was completely excluded because now it was a surgical suture line distally that was attached directly to that cool. stent graft. So you can see flow here in the true lumen. And so lumen. this, this is great. a transesophageal echo that we had at the time of surgery. And you can see that all of the flow is in the smaller true lumen um, but it is contained in that, and you can see that there's already thrombosis right. that started to form in the false lumen, and that's very important for his long-term uh, well-being. 
So this is a CT scan that we got several months later. Um, this is the debranching graft that attaches to his graft on the ascending aorta. That's my inner position graft that's sewn to this last row of uh, stent rings. This is the stent graft that directs all the flow into the true lumen. You can see the remodeling that he's had. Right. His aorta now appears essentially normal. There's no, no flow into the true lumen. And uh, he, he really should well, uh, do, do well for the long haul. That, so here he is back for one of his post-operative visits, and he's active and back doing everything that he was doing before. So, so Morris, this is a, obviously a super complex, complex case. And, and you know, if, if the same thing happened today, okay, so you've had, you know, you do a lot of the tavers, you've had extensive wire experience, all those things. Would you do it any differently today, this, this case? The, the only thing that we would do differently was we would, probably try to extend the stent graft proximally at the time of the first surgery um, with the wire down into the ventricle. Okay. I think we would do that part differently. The rest of it is because the anatomy is so complex and because the perfusion schemes are all complex, a lot of planning has to go into this and so we, you know, we generally involve a fair number of people and different opinions to plan this before we ever start. And this case was done in, with me in conjunction with a vascular surgeon um, but many of these cases we even uh, it, that would involve the ascending aorta because of the parallax issues and the, the importance of uh, the fluoroscopy angles, we would involve an interventional cardiologist. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's a, it's a fabulous case. It, and the only other question I'd have is it, is it characteristics after a type A or type, you know, Type one dissection to see this rapid progression of the the arch and not usually. I mean, it, you know, it seemed a little bit unusual to it, me. This was yeah, this is very unusual. And I, I've got a large number of these patients that right. have had type A dissections that I follow longitudinally, and it's very rare for them to develop. And he this has no problem. other signs of any um, uh, val in, any uh, vascular no connective problems. no and connective an tissue disease. Nerve. He had no family history and no other stigmata of. Uh, Right. Mar fans or any other. Well, I mean, it's a fabulous case. I mean, it's a um, it, it's it's extremely complicated. But I love I love the picture here. The, the patient and the surgeon came out. And we're both smiling. We were both, we were both happy. Both at the end of this. So thank you very much for sharing it. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a really complex case, but a a great case that shows what uh, really expertise can do to help our patients. Thanks very much.